agora eu queria apresentar o próximo palestrante, que é simplesmente uma lenda viva da engenharia de interface. Apresentando Mobile and UX, Inside the Eye of the Perfect Storm, Jared Spool. Greetings and solicitations, designers from South America. Hey, let's make some noise if we've been having fun at Interaction South America. Okay, since Recife is known for its poetry, I have asked the Portuguese interpreter to do my entire presentation in rhyming poem. Does that sound good? Uh, I've been learning Portuguese here. It's been, it's been an interesting experience for me. Uh, 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 oi? Uh, salgados? Aqua semgas? Tu? Abrigado? Ciao! <laughs> Turns out you can survive with that. <laughs> I want to pick up where Arnie left off yesterday. So yesterday we learned, uh, uh, what was it, design thinking. <laughs> right? So I'm going to add a little bit to this. So I want to learn marketing. M marketing. Okay. And hype. So, design, thinking, marketing, marketing, hype. Design, thinking, is marketing, hype. See? Excellent. That'll get you far. Okay. That's not what we came to talk about. Actually, what we came to talk about was this, Coca-Cola. And... Uh, uh, I'm not particularly interested. I would, uh, uh, let's try that. Okay. Uh, I'm not particularly interested in the bottle. I'm interested in the cap. This red cap happens to have 12 letters and numbers uh, uh, underneath it. And what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to go to a website called My Coke Rewards. And at mycokerewards.com, you enter that 12-letter code, and you get points. And if you get enough points, you then get uh, to be able to get luggage and video games, and most importantly, more Coca-Cola. But the funny thing is, is that when they first launched this website, if you decided to... Uh, visit it on your mobile phone, particularly your iPhone, you got this. And what it says is, sorry, you don't have Flash. <laughs> and then it makes the heavy recommendation that you should get Flash. And if you had an iPhone and you tried to get Flash, you could be at it all day because it ain't going to let you download Flash. And Coca-Cola wasn't the only one who had this. Uh, over at Fox News, if you went to their weather site and you brought it up on an iPhone, it said, alternate HTML content should be placed here. <laughs> I hope you brought some. <laughs> One day I was walking through the streets of Washington, D.C., and I saw this poster. This is a campaign poster for a candidate running for a position called shadow representative. I never knew there was a shadow representative. I always suspected that the American government was run by a shadow government. <laughs> but it never occurred to me they had to run for office. But what was interesting about it was it was the first time I'd ever seen a QR code on a political campaign. And I'm thinking, wow. Not only do they run the secret government, but they're, they're really hip. 
they understand QR codes. So of course I, I wanted to see their website. <laughs> and it's just for Mike Panett, shadow represent. You can only see a small piece. For reasons that are completely unknown to me, I was in a bank in Lapeer County, Michigan, which is two hours north of Detroit in an uh, area known as East Bumfuck. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> sure that didn't translate. <laughs> Nonetheless, it is, it is nowhere near society. But they had, in the lobby of a bank in Lapeer County, they had, let your fingers do the banking. And what I love is that they somehow rendered their website on a 1998 Nokia phone. <laughs> so I'm thinking, oh, well, this should also work on my 2007 you know, iPhone 1. No. Nothing. It, 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 you couldn't read it. Everything was too small. Uh, Dana this morning mentioned the Marriott Corporation. I was at an event at the Marriott Corporation. I was trying to use the Internet. It turns out to use the internet at this site from your phone, you had to know to click on this tiny little red button that was in the upper right-hand corner that, of course, you couldn't read. And then you got a screen where you didn't want to click on the thing here or the thing there, but instead that tiny little space at the bottom where you're supposed to enter your code. And, of course, it was very hard to read. And I'm thinking to myself, why are all these big companies and small companies and politicians, why do all these websites suck? And then it occurred to me that there's actually science behind this. There is, there is something that explains how this works, and it's called Sturgeon's Law. For those of you who may have never heard of Sturgeon's Law, it was co coined in the honor of this person. His name is Theodore Sturgeon, and he was an author of science fiction books. Actually, I th think he still is an author of science fiction books. I don't think they took that away from him. And he was at a science fiction conference, and they had a panel, and there was question and answer. And during the Q&A, uh, uh, someone in the audience, a reporter for a, a mainstream magazine, came up and asked him, why is 90% of all science fiction writing crap? And he gave this some very serious thought. And he said, well, that's because 90% of everything is crap. <laughs> and that's Sturgeon's Law. 90% of everything is crap. Now think about this. This is basically true. Think about all the restaurants in the world. 90% of them are restaurants you wouldn't want to go to. Right? Uh, think about all the music that's ever been produced. 90% of it is music you would never want to listen to. 90% right? of everything is crap. And it turns out, in the web world, we're not immune to this. Even big, major companies that have huge budgets are not immune to Sturgeon's Law. Take United. United Airlines, I was very excited. I fly United all the time. I was very, very excited because they had just tried out this new HTML email format. Up until now, everything would have been sent out in text, but now it's this pretty HTML email. And they had a new feature, the ability to go check out your account. So I thought, this was great. I'm just going to click on this. I got the email. I clicked on the link, and I get a URL that says, no, you did not make a mistake. I have to tell you, this was completely reassuring because most of the time I deal with United, I think I have made a mistake. <laughs> but he, uh, uh, or the website said, no, you did not make a mistake. It says, we've redesigned our website. Unfortunately, the URL you requested is no longer valid. I had gotten the email five minutes before. This is an amazing content strategy that they obsolete their content within five minutes of putting it up. Now, of course, United is its own special brand of company. I mean, these are the people who decided that it's important to be completely accessible, that you need to make signs both for people who are portrait and landscape. But 
the this sort of thing, it just happens all the time. Let's go back to that Coke example, because I'm being a little unfair to Coca-Cola. This website lasted for a while, but it turns out that, that it eventually was replaced by this. Now, this is a much better looking site than one that just tells you you need to get Flash. But the problem is, is they took the entire desktop site and they squeezed it down into the mobile. And it was too small. If you wanted to enter your code, you need to enter it right here in that tiny little space. But if you notice carefully, it's a different shade of red than the others. That's because it's grayed out. And Coca-Cola gray is red. Red is the new gray at Coca-Cola. <laughs> and the uh, uh, so instead, what you have to do is you have to log in with your username and password. Or if you don't have a username and password, you have to register here. But of course, this text is so small, it's two-point font, you can't possibly see it, you can't possibly read it. Maybe this isn't fair, because Coca-Cola is not a high-tech company. Coca-Cola is a, a soda company, right? Companies that sell phones, they would know better, right? Well, here's an American phone company called Verizon Wireless. They sell iPhones. The page that sells the iPhone, you can't read it. Nor can you read it on AT&T's page that sells iPhones. In fact, if you go to the iPhone page at apple.com, you cannot read it on an iPhone. I guess the thinking is, if you already have an iPhone, why are you on this page? <laughs> and apps are even worse. Imagine you're in the taxi on your way to the airport to take an Air Canada flight. And what you want to do with your Air Canada flight is you want to check in while you're in the taxi. So you have your boarding pass on your phone. Well, the first thing you have to do is you have to click on this very little field at the bottom of this very small type screen. And then you have to find your country amongst every country in the world. Well, except Brazil. <laughs> and here's the thing. The phone knows which country you're in. Why is it asking you, which country am I in? It's like, you don't know? If you don't know, I don't know. <laughs> and then you get a website that's too small. You can't use it. And I could go on, but there are sites that get this right. One of the most astonishing ones is a site called Boston.com. Boston.com was the first version of the Boston Globe, the newspaper's website. And what's interesting about this site is their desktop version is horrible. It's just this festival of advertising where they hide the content so deep on the page that you can't possibly distinguish it from anything else. But here, on their mobile site, it's clean and elegant and gorgeous. They pulled it off. If they can pull it off, anybody can pull it off. And the New York Times pulled it off. It's very possible to do this. And guess what? When you start adding up the sites that get it right against the sites that get it wrong, the percentage of sites that get it right is 10%. 90% of websites are crap on mobile phones. This is Sturgeon's Law. And the thing about Sturgeon's Law is that we get to decide. This is... a. This is not something that just happens to us. We can decide whether we want to be in the 10% that's not crap or in the 90% that is crap. And remember, not deciding is a decision. And the odds are against you if you're trying to end up in the not crap portion of the percentages. But here's the really important thing. Executives are beginning to realize this too. 
They all got their fancy little iPads and Samsung Galaxy tablets, and one of them got a Nokia thing. And um, <laughs> and and one of them got a BlackBerry Playbook, and they don't know what the hell I do with this. I don't know. It doesn't even do mail. But they all got their fancy ass tablets, and basically they think everything is awesome until they go to their own company website. And they go, what's this? I can't even use this. And suddenly they realize they're in the 90%. And this has been really interesting to me because years ago, we never heard from the executive team ever. And now we're being called in to explain to the executives why their stuff is awful. They want to understand Sturgeon's Law. And this is new. They want to actually do something about that. And we're seeing this happen in more and more and more organizations. If it's not happening in yours yet, it will be soon. And so this is something that's brand new, and it's causing everything to happen. And what we noticed is that mobile and user experience are on this crazy rise. People are using user experience. And Dana showed the video of the President of the United States talking about user research. Everybody's talking about user experience now. This is growing. It's, it's, it's all these things. And we're trying to figure out why this is happening now. And what we realize is it's, it's a sort of a perfect storm. Now, a perfect storm is when smaller storms all come together just at the perfect moment to create this massive storm that just takes off. And that's what we have. And one of the smaller storms that's coming in is this Sturgeon's Law thing. It's coming in and, and taking over. But there's another storm that's coming in at the same time that people are noticing. And this one is called market maturity. This is a Wang 2200 word processor. It was created in 1978. Just out of curiosity, how many people here were not even born in 1978? Damn, that's depressing. I worked on this thing. You know, for many years, I have spoken to audiences of designers who were younger than me. But now I'm speaking to audiences of designers who are younger than my projects. <laughs> that sucks. A couple of those projects I haven't even finished yet. So the Wang 2200, there, I knew I'd get it open eventually. The Wang 2200 was a word processor. It was, it was a device. It stood yay tall, yay wide, yay deep. It cost uh, 32,000 reals. And all it could do is word processing. It couldn't even do spreadsheets. Because this was 1978. Spreadsheets weren't invented until 1979. So the word processor, all it could do is that. Now, if you wanted to learn how to use a Wang 2200 word processor, you could not figure it out from the device. Instead, you had to fly to a city called Lowell, Massachusetts, and you went to a building called the Wang Towers. I could not make this up even if I wanted to. And when you got there, you would take a one-week-long course, and in that course, you would learn how to load a file, how to save a file, how to print a file, and how to change the ribbon on the printer. That was week one. <laughs> if you stayed for the advanced course week two, you got to learn bold and italics. <laughs> italics was tricky. You had to change a little ball in the printer. This device was very popular, sold a ton, 
even though it was so expensive and you had to pay your people to be trained and then you had to give them a raise so that they didn't get hired to some other company who didn't want to pay for them to be trained, you had to go through all this process and spend all this money just to get this because your alternative were typewriters. That was the, that was the only competition at the time. So it was very successful. Until this. This is Word Perfect. And Word Perfect only cost about 1400 reals. And it uh, uh, could run on any computer that cost about, what, 4,000 reals at the time. So it was a much cheaper solution. But the thing about it was it was so packed with features that they created manuals and courses and consultants and, and video training and little cardboard things you put on your keyboard and little cardboard things you put around your monitor and little cardboard things you put around your bathroom mirror. And all of these things were to tell you about all the features. When this was at its peak, it had 1,700 features. And it got to the point where no one could figure out how to use most of those features. So what happened? A little startup in the northwest of the U.S. came out with a little product called Microsoft Word for DOS which became Microsoft Word for Windows. And Microsoft Word for Windows had only 70 features in it. But it had the right 70 features in it. They waited till they saw what was going on and they put out a product that had the right features that people needed. You didn't need to learn all these special keystrokes and codes. You could just use a mouse, which was brand new at the time. You could use a mouse to click in a space and you just start typing and that's where your words appeared on the paper. It changed everything. Now what happens here is what happens often. We see this progression. First we start by just creating technology. And it doesn't matter whether the technology works or not. It just is there. Then we focus on features. And we build feature, 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 feature. And then we have too many features. It's too hard to use. So then we focus on the experience. How can we get our tasks done easier, better? And this progression is the progression we see over and over and over again. And it's cyclical. Now what happens is, in many cases, is the company that comes up with the experience pretty much puts everybody almost out of business. And then they don't know what to do. So what do they do? They go back to features. But the sequence happens over and over again. This is a Motorola phone brick. It weighed four kilos. No, 1.8 kilos, not four kilos. Four pounds, 1.8 kilos. But I have four kilos, man. <sighs> It's for you! <laughs> Damn, metric system screws me up every time. 1.8 kilos cost 4,000 reals, right? And it got crappy reception. Hello? Hello? No! I'm at the movies! No! It's boring! But it was the best thing you could have, right? People would carry them around. And then we got into our phones. And we, the phones all competed on features. First, you know, you could text and then you could send pictures and then you could send videos and then you could download music and then you could watch videos. And then feature after feature after feature after feature. And then experience. Boom. iPhone, right? And here's the thing, iPhone version 1 could not do video. iPhone version 1 could not send pictures from one person to the other. And everybody who made feature phones said, oh, they're not going to do well, I mean, they, they're, they're missing the important features. We know these are the features customers want. We've been putting them into phones for at least two days. 
right? And they knew this. Yet the iPhone was a better experience, and therefore it won. We see this pattern over and over again. Alta Vista. For those of you who don't remember, before Google, <laughs> when you were this big, <laughs> there was Alta Vista. And this was what it looked like, right? This was a search engine, but where the hell is the search box? I mean, it's this tiny little thing here. And then there's advanced search. It's like, oh, I don't just want regular search. No, no. Give me advanced search. <laughs> it's got those booleans. I want booleans. I don't know what they are, but I want them. I can get cats or dogs. Or is it cats and dogs? Damn it. But we had all these features. It was all about the features. And then the first page of Google, this was what they first put out. It was already a much reduced page. It was an experience. And now the Google page is even less. It's even smaller than this. Or let's say you want to know the weather. So you go to AccuWeather.com. This is a list of the things you can do at AccuWeather.com. This isn't the entire list. There are more. They add more every day. They recently added bloopers. What are weather bloopers? <laughs> ah, that lightning hit that guy instead of that truck. That's pretty funny. Let's watch that again. I, I don't know what that is. But what do I want to know, right? So all of a sudden we see other websites come up. This is called UmbrellaToday.com. You put in the name of your city and it says, yes. <laughs> That's it. Pretty simple. So, this is the Air Canada site, right? And you can see they have all these features on the page on the Air Canada site. In fact, if we go to the site map, we can see that they have all these features on the site map. And this is for an airline that only goes eight places. <laughs> and you bring it up on the phone and you get that same page and it's so cramped and small, but that's because you didn't know the magic Password. If you knew the magic URL m.aircanada.com, you'd get a much reduced, better version, one optimized for the phone experience, one that has only the things people actually use. They've left out all the stuff that people don't use and just kept the stuff that people do use. Again, features versus experience. Or let's look at uh, uh, BART, right? So BART is the subway system in San Francisco. So you land at the San Francisco airport and you want to figure out how, f when the next train is to get downtown. You've got this table of data. Where's Pedro? Right? We need a pulsing map to tell me when the train is coming. That's what I want. The, 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 you can't read that. But, if you know the magic secret URL, bart.gov slash wireless, you can do it. You can get the information you need. You just need to be privileged. Know that magic URL. But this two-site thing, this mobile site, this full-site thing, this is the wrong approach. Right? The right approach is for the website to adapt to create a better experience. And the better experience is a simple experience. The better experience is you get something that looks like the site, but not quite. Right? This is the Amazon site. And if, it, if you go to the American Amazon site, it looks almost like this, but not quite. Yet it has everything you can do on the American site on the phone version of the American site. Sorry, U.S. site. You guys are Americans too. I keep forgetting that. It's an American thing. We forget that you're Americans. <laughs> <laughs> so
So, but when you go to it, it's, it feels familiar. It feels like the same site. Even though there's something not quite the same, it feels right. They have mastered the whole thing. And even something as important a detail as reviews, they've modified it, optimized it for the phone. Not just created a second site that says, well, who uses reviews? We're not going to get to that. We'll leave it out. We'll fix it in version 7. So that's what they did. Or the electronics retailer, BestBuy.com. BestBuy.com actually has functionality on their phone version that's better than the functionality on their desktop version. It turns out that, that you can find a TV by selecting the price and the attributes that you want, and once you've picked out the size and the, the, the type of television you want, it makes a recommendation. And they've created a better experience on mobile. And that's the new focus, is on the experience not on the features, not on the technology. And oftentimes, in order to get from the feature stage to the, to the experience stage, we actually have to remove functionality. We have to say no. No is an important word in design. And we have to learn to say it. So market maturity is about this progression of technology to features to uh, experience. And the thing is, you don't get to decide. The customers decide. And if you don't, if you're not ready when the customers decide, a competitor is going to come along and eat your lunch. Is that a Portuguese term, eat your lunch? In, in the U.S., apparently we eat each other's lunches when we don't like them. <laughs> I don't know, I was always hiding in my locker. <laughs> Often not by my own choice. <laughs> so, the, the uh, market maturity is, is key. And again, the executives are starting to ask about this. And this is part of that storm. Right? It's, it's this thing. I mean, we've had this for years. We've known about this. I've been talking about this for 10 years. But now, it's, it's resonating with companies everywhere. It used to be people would tell us, oh, that doesn't mean anything on the web. That doesn't mean anything in mobile. And it turns out, yeah, it does. It's the same patterns over and over and over again. But it's still not the big storm yet. For that, we have to add in what we call activities versus experience. And this goes somewhat to what Mark was talking about today. This is uh, Six Flags Magic Mountain. It's a, an amusement park. You know, it has roller coasters and, and all of those magic things. And it... Um, uh, and this is the map that they give you the moment you walk into the park and you give them your money. They give you this map. So this is this. Everything is free in the park. This costs eighty dollars. And this map tells you everything you can do. And the way that you you go to a, a Six Flags park, I mean, they have something like seventy five rides in this park. And the way that you 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 go on each of these rides is is you you come in to the main gates and you and you go to the left the, the park is designed for you to go to the left and then just sort of go around the park and the whole idea is that you you first go up and you get into a really long line and then you get on a really short ride and then you have a really long period where you throw up and then you get in another really long line, and you go on another short ride, and then another long throw up, and that is your day at Six Flags. This is why you paid all that great money, 180 reals. And this is, uh, uh, this is the Six Flags thing, and they designed this map. The map reflects the way they think. They designed this map so you don't miss anything. Anything you can do at the park is on the map. 
You can check it off as you do it all. Now compare this map to Walt Disney's Magic Kingdom. Walt Disney's Magic Kingdom doesn't show any rides. They have rides. They have just as many rides. And they're just as cool, if not cooler. But the map, you can't see the rides. Now, yes, if you are the type of person who knows the Magic Kingdom and you know what the rides look like, the architectural elements, yes, you can pick them out. But if you don't know that, they don't tell you. Because the map is not important at Disney World. Disney World has a completely different way that they want you to go through the park. If you have a little six-year-old and you go to the Magic Kingdom, chances are one of your days will start with the character breakfast. Whoops, I'll go back. There we go. go. The character breakfast. And the character breakfast is this opportunity for you and your six-year-old to get up close and personal with a creepy guy in an animal suit. (laughs) And together, you will make what will be the most expensive breakfast of your life. (laughs) And everybody loves it. Your kid loves it and you love it because it's so cute and the creepy guy in the animal suit seems to really love it. And everybody loves it. And then you wander into the park when you're done with your breakfast and you have an adventure and then you have another adventure and then you have another adventure. And it's all about adventures. And finally, at the end of the day, the skies turn dark and then they erupt with what is the longest fireworks show you will ever attend. And it's synchronized with music and you can hear the music perfectly because they have carefully planted in the garden speakers. So that no matter where you stand, you hear the exact same music everybody else is hearing. And this goes on and your kid is like, wow. And then at the end of the the fireworks, you take your completely exhausted child and you put them on your shoulder and you go back, not to your hotel room, because Disney does not have hotel rooms. Disney has resorts. You go back to your resort and you open the door of your resort and what do you find but that someone has come in while you were gone and taken your towels and made little animals out of them. They have housekeepers who know how to do origami with washcloths. That's how Disney thinks. Right? They don't think about, you have 78 rides, we have to get them through the 78 rides. They think in terms of the whole thing. We can put this on a scale. We can say, basically, Six Flags is all about discrete activities. They focus on an activity. They focus on another activity. They focus on an activity. How you get from one to the other, that's your problem, man. But Disney, Disney is about experience. They fill in the gaps between the activities. They design the whole experience. This is exactly what Mark and Arnie and people have been talking about for the last two days. Anyone who's tried to hail a cab in a major city in the rain knows that it's an impossible Herculean task, that that really only the mightiest will survive. This is the pinnacle of human natural selection. (laughs) Though, actually... (laughs) We were having a conversation the other night at dinner, and I said, you know, it's really nice to be at the top of the food chain. And Josh Seiden says, if we were at the top of the food chain, I'd be at the beach swimming right now. (laughs) You guys have a little bit of more of your food chain than we have up our way. Dun, um, dun, 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 dun. (laughs) Seriously, I could hear that music from my window. Dun, 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 dun. (laughs) <laughs> 
think it was the couple next door. <laughs> I've completely lost my place. Because I saw the couple next door, and I don't want to imagine that anymore. <laughs> imagining, imagining, experiencing a taxi. I want to see how they translate that. Should we get back to this now? Are we done screwing around? Trying to get a taxi in the rain in any city is very difficult. And then a service comes along called Uber. And Uber changed everything. And now you guys have Easy Taxi, and that's a sort of Brazilian Uber clone, which is a phrase I never thought I would say out loud. <laughs> Brazilian Uber clone. Oh, the Brazilian, I'm the Brazilian Uber clone. I am easy taxi. No, you have to wait. <laughs> and so I, so I hear it's the same, but the way Uber worked, and it was a miracle, right? It's the first time it ever worked this way was you would press a button that says, come pick me up, and it would use the GPS on the phone to figure out where you were, and it would then contact a driver, and the driver would say, yes, I'm nearby, I can come pick them up, and then it actually draws a little map, and it tells you how close the driver is to where you are, and it tells you how much time, and you can call the driver and talk to them directly, they can call you and you know say, where are you? And they'd say, well, I've stepped into the, the drugstore because it started to rain, and and, and okay, and, and they come, and, and then you get in the cab, and, and it's done. And then that whole ritual at the end where, you know, you have to figure out the fare, and, and you're reaching in your pockets, and, you, you know, they pop the trunk so that the, your bags are now exposed to the world, and someone is coming up and taking the bags out of the trunk while you're trying to pay the driver. And uh, uh, all that crazy goes away because there's just a button that says, uh, uh, you know, pay this and, and send me the receipt to my... Uh, email and it's and it pays right out of your credit card and it's done and then and then you rate your driver as to how good they were so that next time if you, when you get it you, it tells you how many stars the driver has and it's good because the driver just rated you so they know whether you're a good passenger and if you're not a good passenger they don't they, you know if, if you're that drunk couple you don't get back in the cab <laughs> so that's thinking about the whole experience. Or Groupon. You have Groupon here? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> it takes half your money all the time. <laughs> it's about 50% of all your money. That's what Groupon is. And uh, uh, Groupon, it, uh, uh, when, you, when, you, you know, the, when you first started with Groupon, you had to print out the little pieces of paper and you had to take it to the place. But then they, they created an app and now you can have the receipt always on your phone. So it's like you walk by a place, damn it, I left my Groupon thing at home. You don't have that anymore. They thought of that piece of the experience, so they're thinking of the whole thing. And some of this has to do with the technology. The technology can do much of this. But, the, but here we have, for instance... The uh, uh, QR code, this was in Melbourne, Australia. I walked up and it said, you can live here, right? This was a giant wall and there was this giant QR code. And, and so I'm like, okay, what is it? And I didn't know what was behind the wall. And it turns out it was dirt. But the dirt was going to be turned into an apartment building. And there was this mobile website that's better than the, the Marriott website that you can fill out that, that, that tell, gives you information. And it, and it was great. But QR codes don't always work. For example, these QR codes are in the Denver airport in the subway tunnel where you can't get any signal. <laughs> this bank paid for these ads for nothing. Good move, dude. So I don't think QR codes are the solution here. I think we need something that's more fluid, less distractive, that doesn't involve a special app on your phone that is going to get us that sort of fluid experience. But that's the thing, right? That's this whole activities versus experience thing. And, and people are realizing that, that, 
the money now, the competitive edge, is in the experience part. It's not just in the discrete activities, because everybody has the same activities. It's what you do with the gaps between those activities that, that are important. So it turns out that that uh, is the, 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 the third storm, but there's one more. And the one more is something we call the Kano model. And the Kano model is actually was invented by this guy named Noriaki Kano. And he had this question. He wanted to know if uh, the, uh, uh, the amount of investment you made affected the satisfaction of the customer. So he went off and he, he created this model to sort of simulate this. And, and in the process of creating the model, he, he came up with this idea which is that the output of the model is this satisfaction thing, and it goes from extreme frustration to extreme delight. And the input of the model is the amount of investment that the organization makes, from almost nothing to a ton. And what he found was that there were basically three trends that, that sort of predicted what would happen when, when you started to make those investments. One of the trends is called performance payoff, and performance payoff is that feature thing. It's just adding feature, 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 feature. feature. And eventually you invest enough, it'll pay off. But it turns out that wasn't the only one. There was another trend which he called basic expectations. And basic expectations is what the customer brings as an expectation that has nothing to do with you. You travel almost anywhere in the world, you stay at a hotel, and almost every hotel, you're going to walk into your hotel room, and right there in the front of the hotel room is going to be on the left, a little room with a toilet, a sink, a shower. It's pretty much guaranteed in almost any decent hotel across the world. And here's the thing. Most of those hotel websites never mention this. They never say, hey, you're going to have a room in your bedroom where you can take a shower and no one else will come in. Right? They never say this. This is new. I mean, it's not like new yesterday, but it's new in a couple of generations, right? Your parents' grandparents, if they went to a hotel, they probably did not stay in a hotel where there was a bathroom in every room. When Mary and Joseph checked into the manger, they did not get a private bathroom. It turns out that this is, in all of humanity, this is a very new phenomena. But it's something we all expect. The other thing that Kano talked about is called excitement generators. And excitement generators are little investments that make things better. And sometimes they're really inexpensive investments. Like the example that Mark showed before about, uh, you know, taking pictures of the kid's doll doing, you know, manual labor in the hotel. It's nice that the kid leaves the thing so that they can get some manual labor done. And so suddenly there's, there's, you know, these little things that are inexpensive. They don't take much investment, but they delight customers. And those are excitement generators. We have this app in the U.S. called Shazam. Do you have this here? Yes, okay. So for those of you who've never seen this, what it does is it, you, you, you hear some music and you point it at the speaker and it, and it listens to the music and then it says, yes, that's what this is. You get some Tom Jones. And then you can download it. It's pretty awesome. In the U.S., if you go to a club, the only place you can clearly hear the music is in the bathroom. So you walk in the bathroom and there are all these people pointing at the speaker. That's dedication. This is delightful. I was flying into Washington, D.C., and, and, and I, I tweeted, I've landed at, at IAD for the code for Dulles Airport. And I immediately got a a tweet back from this company called Limo Res that says, have a great time, need a ride from IED? For those of you who've never flown into Goas Airport, it is strategically located nowhere. 
And so you have to go, and it costs forever to go. So I didn't actually have a ride into the city, and I wanted, so I checked them out. And, it, you know, they had a site that was a little hard to read, but it was easy to find their phone number, and boom, I was able to call them, and it turned out they had a decent price. So I, I took it. And this was really delightful. If you use Google Docs, one of the best things about Google Docs is the ability to share documents. Google Docs, for those of you who have never used it, is basically word processing and spreadsheets in the cloud. And by the way, when I say in the cloud, I mean on a server in Virginia. (laughs) The oddest thing about things in the cloud is that when I'm in the air in a plane above the clouds, I can't get to that stuff. So you want to be able to share documents. It turns out this is incredibly delightful once you get used to it. You're sharing documents with all your friends. And and so when the mobile version came out, it was something that we wanted to do. We wanted to be able to share the document. You're going into a meeting. Hey, did you get the document? Oh, I didn't see the document. Oh, let me share it with you. But it didn't work. You could not share. They left that feature out. For some reason, it was too hard to put into the mobile version. You could not share from the first release of the mobile version. And this is the problem with basic expectations. That line is neutral satisfaction. Satisfaction neutrally is being edible. Right? It's, 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 you don't say it's great food, you say it's edible. Right? This is, neutral satisfaction is not a very good mark. We want delightful satisfaction and basic expectations only get you to neutral. And all you can do is screw it up. Google could only screw it up. go back to the Coke website. I'm trying to register to get in. So I click on the little register button. It says, hey, it's as easy as one, two, three. Okay, you set my expectations. It's going to be easy. And by easy, we mean that first I have to enter my name and my address and my phone number and my zip code. And then I have to enter my username twice and my password twice. And then uh, 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 I have to uh, uh, answer the question as to whether I want to get emails from you forever about how wonderful Coke is, and then uh, answer the question about whether I want to get emails about how wonderful Coke is on a mobile phone. And then I have to prove to you I'm not a robot. Because saying no to the email questions wasn't proof enough. Compare that to Groupon, where with Groupon... I enter my full name because computers can figure this out. I enter my email address once, my password twice, and I'm in. That's it. And that's the Kano model. The Kano model is basically this idea that that you have excitement generators, you have basic expectations. And one of the things is, is that today, the things that are delightful, the things that are excitement generators, will tomorrow just be basic expectations. Because over time, your competitors will add them, and then they'll be like the bathrooms in the hotel room, where they're no longer exciting. No one goes, oh my God, the hot water in the shower was awesome. (laughs) And my toilet, it didn't overflow once. You only have to flush it once. How cool is that? (laughs) Actually, that is sort of cool. So, that's it, right? Over time, basic expectations become or uh, excitement generators become basic expectations. So the Kano model is this other thing that people are beginning to recognize and they're beginning to realize that this is something that's really important. And so these are the four storms, and they have created this perfect storm that has put UX and mobile at the center. And now is our time. It is now our opportunity to jump in and say, hey, You want that thing to run on your iPod really cool? You need to learn about this user experience thing. You need to learn how to do great design, how to do the user research, how to do all of the great work, because that's what's going on. And we have the know-how to do it, and we can make it happen. And that's what I came to talk to you about. So here's the deal. You want to be in the 10%, not the 90%. So you want to pay attention to Sturgeon's Law and ask that question. Make sure everybody understands how that works. You need to talk to everybody about the difference between technology, features, and experience and how you are going to have to be ready when your market shifts to experience if it hasn't already. And you need to fill in the gaps 
of those activities and focus on that whole journey of the customer. Understand that. that and finally, you need to make sure that you're paying attention to those basic expectations. You're not ignoring them, while at the same time, you're looking at those delighters for now. But understand, they will become basic expectations. And this is what I came to talk to you about. If for some reason you thought this was the least bit interesting, you can find me in a variety of places. My website is uie.com. Uh, I'm on the Twitters where you can learn about design, design education, and the amazing customer service experiences that United delivers. And you can follow me on LinkedIn. I'd love to follow you. If you're working in UX, I want to follow you on LinkedIn. So connect up with me there. Ladies and gentlemen, Thank you very much for encouraging my behavior. Uh, 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 uh,